So last week we were talking about uh, hypoventilation and hyperventilation. So if we hypoventilate, what does that mean? Yeah, so it means we're breathing slow. Our tidal volume is either smaller, the respiratory rate is lower. And what is what happens to the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood when we do that? Right, because we're not exhaling it and get, getting rid of it, so it builds up in the alveoli and then it builds up in the blood. Um, what happens to the level of oxygen if we're hypoventilating? It's displaced. So it's displaced by the CO2 and it goes down. Okay, decreases. Um, and then hyperventilate. What do we do when we hyperventilate? Fast rate yes. or big tidal volumes. Yes. You know my question, and you already have the answers. <laughs> okay, so we're blowing off a lot of carbon dioxide, so that means if we're blowing it off, then the level of the blood is going to be lower than it normally is. And then the level of oxygen is going to be higher because we're breathing in more. The other thing we talked about were gases in the alveoli. Can we just call out some gases that we find in the alveoli? Okay, so I heard oxygen, I heard carbon dioxide, I heard nitrogen. Yes. What else? Water vapor. Water vapor. Yes. So all that exists in the alveoli. Is there a way for us to figure out how much oxygen is in the alveoli? How could we do that? Yes, the alveolar air equation. All right, so that takes us to today. Our airs <laughs> so it's cool as it is. Yeah, I That's why we can't make it. No, the application is dangerous. No. Okay. I can get that. Wonderful. I'm glad you were Because if you couldn't, I just wouldn't be able to get any more material to get ready. Well, can we all agree to that? All right, let's talk about the AA gradient. That's another biggie in respiratory therapy. And the reason it's a biggie is because of its importance. Um, if you have oxygen in the alveoli, but the oxygen can't get into the blood, then the patient's going to have a low oxygen level in their blood. They'll be hypoxemic. The tissues won't get enough oxygen. So we want to make sure that the blood is getting enough oxygen. So sometimes we have to give a lot more oxygen to the alveoli so that some of it will, will get into the blood. Um, so that's referred to as the AA gradient. So the capital A, do you remember what capital A is for? Alveolar. And little a? Arterial. So the oxygen gradient from the alveolus into the arterial blood is the AA gradient. Says that in healthy lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli should equal the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. They should be equal if, if everything's healthy. Um, however, there is a 5 to 10 torr difference. Do you know what the units torr are equal to? Yes, millimeters of mercury. So torr, millimeters of mercury mean the same thing. Um, so when you're Talking about a blood gas, the physician you can either say you know, PaO2 is 60 millimeters mercury, or you can say it's 60 torr. So you use millimeters mercury torr and change it. Um, so why would there be a 5 to 10 torr difference? It seems like you've got healthy lungs, the oxygen in the alveolus is going to get into the arterial blood. But there are normal anatomical shuttles. And do I tell you guys about this shuttle?
No, I don't mention it. Um, so you need to write down the normal anatomical shunts are bronchial circulation and Fabesian veins. <clears throat> bronchial circulation and Fabesian veins. So this is venous blood that drains into the left atrium. So venous blood is lacking oxygen, and it's draining into the left atrium. So it's going to dilute the blood that has all the oxygen on it, and that's why when we take a blood sample, we're seeing a little bit lower oxygen than what's in the atrium. Okay? So anatomical shunts. And then the other reason is there's ventilation to perfusion inequality. And that's pretty much what the rest of the lecture is about today. Um, but in a nutshell, ventilation, perfusion, inequalities. Ventilation is air that gets to the alveoli. Perfusion is the blood that flows through the capillaries. So ventilation is air in the alveoli. Perfusion is the blood flow through the capillaries. No, perfusion is blood, blood flow through the capillaries. All right, so what, you don't have to write this down because I explained it over and over in the next several slides. But you would think that if you have air and blood, um, the proportion is equal. The same amount of air, the same amount of blood, everything's perfect in a healthy lung, and then we have a, a good oxygen level. But it doesn't always match up one for one. So that's what we'll talk about, and that's what creates a little bit lower amount of oxygen in the arterial blood. So the AA gradient. Uh, I want you to write down some calculations. All right, so calculate the AA gradient if the alveolar the pressure of oxygen in the alveoli is 110 torr. So P capital A O2. And the pressure of oxygen in arterial blood is 90 torr. So P little a O2 equals 90 torr. What is the AA gradient? Do you know how to calculate it? You've got what's in the alveolus, you've got what's in arterial blood. What is the gradient between the two? What do you think you have to do? Subtract. Yes, very good. <laughs> Subtract the two numbers and tell me what the AA gradient is. Yeah, so the AA gradient is 20 torr. All right, so we said normal is between 5 and 10 torr. So is this a normal <coughs> AA gradient? No. no. All right, so one more set of numbers just to get used to it. What if alveolar oxygen is 100 torr? And arterial oxygen is 64. What is the AA gradient? 40 torr, or 40 millimeters. <coughs> so is that considered normal? What is the normal range for the? All right, so it says that the AA gradient increases in diseased lungs, and sometimes dramatically. So if you have a big difference between alveolar oxygen and capillary oxygen, there's a lot going on with the lungs that's not letting oxygen get through into the blood. So now do you see the importance of that number? Mm -hmm. So if the AA gradient is 300, 
What do you think about the lungs? Are they healthy? No. <laughs> no. So there's some disease going on there. Whether it's pulmonary edema, because that can make a difference. You have all kinds of fluid flooding the interstitial spaces and flooding the alveoli. Oxygen isn't going to get from the alveoli into the blood very easily. Um, so you're going to get a big difference between the numbers. And then it says, name some reasons why oxygen may not get through to the capillaries. And it's addressed in the slides that are coming up. So if you want to just write C next slide. Your notes, can you come back to it? Um, <laughs> should we turn off the lights, lock the door, and hide under a desk? <laughs> Um, so it's addressed, the person asks a question, and then we have to come up with this multiple, multiple answer. Which of the following conditions can increase the length of a diffusion path? And when it's talking about a diffusion path, it's talking about getting from the alveolus into the capillary wall. Um, so diffusion path is from alveolus into capillary. Diffusion path is from alveolus into capillary. All right, so our choices. What if we have fibrotic thickening of the alveolar and capillary walls? Do you think that would interfere with oxygen trying to get through from the alveolus into the capillaries? Mm -hmm. You've got fibrotic tissue in between. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so that's a definite. What about fluid <laughs> in the alveoli? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it harder for oxygen to get through fluid than to not have fluid? Yes. yes. All right, so that's one. Interstitial edema fluid. Yes. Yes. Because if you have fluid in the interstitial space, that's still making it difficult for the oxygen to get from the alveolus into the capillary. Um, capillary vasoconstriction. So if the capillary constricts and there's less blood flow? Mm -hmm. yeah. No. I don't think so. Not yeah. yeah, really. <clears throat> now we would still have oxygen yeah. getting from the alveolus into the catheter. Mm. Wouldn't you have less blood for it to But it's talking yeah. about diffusion. You would have less blood, but that would not increase the diffusion yeah. path. Yeah. Oh. Still there. Oh. So the answer is A. Mm -hmm. So circle A. And then it just reiterates what we said. It says various abnormal conditions can increase the diffusion path length, including the following. Number one, fibrotic thickening of alveolar and capillary walls. So if it's thicker, oxygen can't get through. Interstitial edema fluid separating alveolar and capillary membranes. So yes, that's going to make it more difficult. Fluid in the alveoli will. Interstitial fibrotic processes that thicken the interstitial space. So some people have fibrotic lung disease. If they've been working with asbestos and, and shipbuilding or whatever, um, coal mines, the, the coal deposits and, and creates just a real thick interstitial space and makes the lungs stiff. So they have a hard time oxygenating. Um, and then five, if you have dilated and gorged capillaries, um, and red blood cells are flowing side by side, then oxygen can't get to all of the um, red blood cells. So that's one that was not mentioned. And we see that with liver cirrhosis, cirrhosis of the liver, um, damage to the liver, it causes the capillaries to dilate. And we'll notice, oh wow, it's so hard to oxygenate this patient. What is the connection? And the connection is that the capillaries have dilated. So half the blood is flowing fast and not picking up oxygen. Did you know that the AA gradient increases from normal to 50 to 60 if the only thing you did differently is to breathe 100% oxygen? And what is the reason? So when we're breathing room air, 
5 to 10 TOR is a normal AA gradient, but when we're breathing 100%, we're going to notice a difference. Um, so if we get our alveolar air equation and we figure out what our alveolar oxygen level is, then we draw some arterial blood and we'll see that, um, so what would it be, 700 minus 40? About 650, maybe a little bit less. 640 should be the amount of oxygen in our capillaries or in arterial blood if we're breathing a non rebreather mix, let's say. Um, but it's a little bit lower. It's usually about 600 because <laughs> um, not all, when there's 100% oxygen, um, some of the, I don't know if you guys learned about this yet in the equipment where you have absorption atelectasis. I think it's washed out. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing holding the alveoli open when you're breathing 100% oxygen. Um, so a lot of the alveoli will collapse from that, and now you don't have as much oxygen getting through into the blood. Um, so the reason would be It makes us curious, doesn't it? Yeah. We should set the camera up in there. <laughs> and then for break, we can play it back. And see what's going on. Yeah. Um, the reason with a high percentage of oxygen um, alveoli can collapse and there is less getting into the blood. How's that? So it doesn't seem important to know how much oxygen when I, if I give you a scenario and I say, what is the AA gradient, and you figure it out, and then I ask, is that normal? Well, one thing you're going to have to know is the patient breathing room air, but they breathing 100%, because that's going to make a difference. So if I tell you that they're breathing 100%, or say they're breathing an hourly breather mass, then you're going to know it's 100%, and you're going to say, aha, about 50 to 60 is a normal AA gradient, the breathing 100%. Got it? Mm -hmm. All right, so first we're going to discuss ventilation in the lung. So when we breathe in air, does it go equally to the top of the lungs as it does to the bottom of the lungs? Yes, no. First of all, it gives you the definition of ventilation. Breathing air in and out of the lungs is ventilation. And more air enters the bases of the lungs than the APCs. Matter of fact, four times as much air goes to the bases than to the APCs of the upright lung. And this is due to, which is not in your notes, so write it down, due to higher negative pressure in the bases when the diaphragm contracts. So it's due to a higher negative pressure in the bases when the diaphragm contracts. So when the diaphragm contracts, there's maybe a negative two at the bases, and maybe a negative one in the apices. So that negative two lower down pulls more air to the bases. Then if we talk about fusion to the lung, and again it's um, abbreviated with a Q, anytime you're talking about blood flow, Q, same thing. It says more blood perfuses the lower lung regions than the upper lung regions. And the reason for that is due to gravity. 
So when you have your pulmonary artery coming across and going to, um, and the hilum that goes across and then distributes, mm -hmm. um, blood vessels that go up from that point are going against gravity. Blood vessels that go down are being helped with gravity. So more blood is going to be pulled down to the bases of the lungs than the apices. So doesn't it sound like the bases of the lungs are like a happening place? Yeah. You've got more air, you've got more blood, a lot more stuff going on down there. All right, so if we compare the different lung zones, and all of this is representing what's normal. So there's zone one, a zone two, a zone three. So zone one would be like the upper lobes, so it's the lung apex. We know that there's more ventilation than there is blood flow. And when we compare the ventilation to the blood flow, we see the ratio is 3.3. That's not a number to memorize, it's just for you to learn a concept. So if you see a, a, a number greater than one, that means you've got more ventilation than you do perfusion. In zone two, the mid lung, so that would be in the middle lobes in that area, it says that ventilation and perfusion are equal. So if we compare the two, we've got the same amount of ventilation as we do perfusion, and we come up with a ratio of 1.0. So again, the number isn't to memorize, but it just tells you that it's equal. Then you look at zone three in the lung bases. There's actually more perfusion, more blood flow, than there is ventilation in the bases. So there's more perfusion than there is ventilation. And when we compare the two, we have a number less than one. Do you know with fractions, the, the bigger the number on the bottom, uh, compared to the number on the top, the smaller the number? So like, one half versus one tenth. So two on the bottom versus ten on the bottom. So the bigger the number on the bottom, the smaller the number. So in the lung bases, when you compare perfusion and ventilation, there's more perfusion, so the ratio is actually less than one. And then when the blood is returning to the heart, blood from all three lung zones mix together to give us our average PaO2 of 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, so if you draw a sample of blood from the artery and you put the sample into a machine and analyze it, um, normal lung, you're going to see an oxygen level between 90 and 100. So all this stuff comes together and gives us our normal oxygen level. Well, there's some blanks for you to fill in. It says blood from all zones comes together, which results in a PaO2 of blank. What are you going to put there? Yes. What units are you going to use? Millimeters mercury. What else could you use? Four. Um, and then a normal PaCO2. I sort of showed it to you in a graph last week. That's the only time we actually saw it. Do you remember? Normal CO2 in the blood? 30, 40, very good. So 40 millimeters of mercury, or 40 total. All right, so looking at the different lung regions, we already talked about the VQ ratios. Um, the amount of oxygen in the alveoli and the apices, there's a lot of ventilation, so we see a high oxygen level. The middle, it's 100, and then the bases, it's a little less, because we have less ventilation, so the oxygen level is less. And when all of this combines, it combines to give us our PaO2 of 90 to 100. Um, with the CO2, um, there's a lot more ventilation in the apices, so we notice that it's lower than our normal. In the bases, we don't have as much ventilation as we do perfusion, so CO2 is a little bit higher. And then in the middle, it's the same as what we find with arterial blood. All right. So, what do you have? What message should you take away from all of this? Um, when you're comparing ventilation and perfusion in the different lung zones, you're going to come up with 
different proportions, therefore different oxygen levels, different CO2 levels, but in the end, when it all comes together and goes back to the left heart, you have to know what the normal is, which 90 to 100 for your oxygen level and 40 millimeters mercury for your CO2 level. Mm -hmm. of a high VQ. So if you just look at VQ, in order for that number to be high, what would you have to have? More ventilation or more perfusion? More ventilation. Yeah, so usually when you say high VQ, it means that you have more ventilation than you do perfusion. Um, and that's what it says in the first bullet. Uh, higher ventilation compared to blood flow. Ventilation is greater than normal but it can also mean perfusion less than normal. Um, the takeaway message from that, when there's a high VQ, it generally implies a blood flow defect. Something's wrong with the blood that's going to the lungs. So it generally implies a blood flow defect. got the ventilation, you don't have the perfusion, there's something going on with perfusion. Maybe there's a blood clot at the pulmonary embolus, um, and the blood is not getting to the lungs to pick up oxygen. But you've got great ventilation, the air is going in and out, you just don't have the blood coming to pick it up. Um, so you have good ventilation for perfusion, you would say high VQ. What is the significance of a low VQ? And that generally implies low ventilation. So that generally implies low ventilation when you say low VQ. So it could mean other things, but that's the takeaway message from this. So it could mean, um, the second bullet, it says, Ventilation can be less than normal, or perfusion is greater than normal. So yes, that is true. Most of the time, when you say low VQ, we're talking about not having enough ventilation. So I need you to write some more notes. Um, remember that PaCO2, remember that P, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to say it. You said little a. Which one, yeah. Um, a little a, um, the pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood, P little a CO2, varies inversely with the level of alveolar ventilation. varies inversely with the level of alveolar ventilation. And then write the word hypoventilate. Therefore, P little a CO2 increases. and P little a O2 decreases. So when we hyperventilate, the level of CO2 increases in the arterial blood, and the level of O2 decreases. Low VQ. Wait, you said when we hyperventilate, no, hyperventilate, high off, so, so the PaO2 increases. increases, and what decreases? Yeah, I'm glad you got that clarified. <laughs> so hypoventilate, CO2 goes up, PO2 goes down. 
You got that right? Okay. Yeah, go ahead and go back there. Alright, so if a patient is hypoventilating, um, how does that change their VQ ratio? So could you say low VQ? Yeah. Alright, we're getting the connection. Alright, so that leads us into talking about hypoxemia. And the word hypoxemia means low amount of oxygen in the blood. <coughs> so low amounts of oxygen in the blood, why is it happening? I mean, at, at the bedside, it's like, oh, you put a pulse oximeter on the patient, and instead of having your um, 98 to 100% saturation, the oxygen saturation is really low. 89%. Wow, so you put oxygen on them, maybe you put a nasal cannula on, maybe an honorary breather mask, and the goal is to get the saturation back up to a normal range. But then the question in the back of your mind is like, well, what's causing this um, hypoxemia? And that's what we're discussing. We're putting it into categories. So the first category is shunted blood. <laughs> says that when blood flows to the lung and does not pick up oxygen, it flows back to the left side of the heart deoxygenated or unoxygenated or whatever word you want to use. But it's lacking oxygen. This can occur due to anatomical defects or physiologic defects. Um, anatomic effects include heart defects. As I mentioned, um, the Fabician drainage, bronchial circulation drainage into the left heart, but then there can be problems with the heart, and that can cause blood to not go to the lungs and to go to the left side without keeping the oxygen. Like if there's a hole in the heart um, between the, the atria or ventricle, something like that. So the blood is you know, going through the hole and never going to the lungs. Um, so, some physiologic effects. So, those were anatomic, and now we're talking physiologic. So, physiologic effects of shunted blood would be um, pulmonary edema. Do you feel comfortable with that? If I say pulmonary edema, do you get a picture in your mind of alveoli floating with water? Like there's a flood in the alveoli. So, pulmonary edema, that's what you think of. You think the interstitial spaces have a lot a lot of extra fluid in them, or there's so much fluid they're actually in the alveoli. So when you think pulmonary edema, get that picture in your mind. Um, ARDS, it stands for um, Adult or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And what happens with that is there's inflammation with the alveolar um, epithelial cells. So inflammation of the alveoli, surfactant gets washed out of the alveoli, and alveoli cannot participate in gas exchange. Alveoli cannot participate in gas exchange. So you learn about ARDS in great detail because a lot of the patients in ICU end up in ARDS. Um, it can be caused from a trauma to the body. So if it's a motor vehicle crash, um, one of the ways the body responds is by capillary leakage and ARDS. So it could be um, after surgery, they go into ARDS. It could be from a pneumonia, they go into ARDS. A lot of different reasons. Um, and then your goal, usually they end up intubated because you've had them on a non-rebreather mask. You then you put them on positive pressure like BiPAP. That didn't work. Now they're intubated. You have them on the ventilator. You have your FiO2 at 100%. You're still not getting enough oxygen into their blood. And then you end up using a lot of positive pressure to get the oxygen to get into the blood. Um, so that's what you deal with a lot. So ARDS, you'll have a lot of lecture time on that your pathophysiology class clinically. Um, for us, we're just trying to understand 
what's happening, why the oxygen isn't getting from the alveoli into the lungs. So with ARDS, just imagine that the alveoli become damaged, they lose their surfactants, and now they're not participating in gas exchange. So um, does, I have a question. Does that mean that the lungs, the lungs um, collapse because of the lack of surfactant? The alveoli collapse, yeah. So there's a lot of atelectasis. Um, and then the next one there is sepsis. Sepsis is a yeah, massive infection in the body. A lot of capillary leakage and a lot of pulmonary edema. So sepsis is a massive infection in the body. There's a lot of capillary leakage and a lot of pulmonary edema. All of this leads to alveoli not being able to partake in the transfer of oxygen to the blood because of the edema. So that's the bottom line. That's why patients have low blood oxygen. It says that hypoxemia due to shunted blood will be refractory to supplemental oxygen. Uh, refractory means does not respond. And then supplemental oxygen is referring to, like you put them on a cannula, you can't get their stats up, you're all the way up to a six liter cannula. Um, then you switch over, you might go to a partial rebreather mask, still their stats are low. Then you go to a non-rebreather, still their saturation is low. So now we say that they're refract refractory to supplemental oxygen. They're not responding no matter how much Oxygen we give them to the alveoli is not getting through into the blood. It says that the AA gradient will be increased, but it doesn't tell you how much. Um, so larger than 100, AA gradient, larger than 100 tor, is typical of shunted blood. So if I give you a scenario and I mention these things, do you think you could identify the scenario as the patient having shunted blood and that's why they're hypoxemic? So if I say that they have um, septic shock, you have them on 100% oxygen and their saturation is 88%, their um, oxygen saturation is 88%. We figured out the A gradient and it was huge. I don't know what number off the top of my head. Is this shunted blood? Can you be able to recognize it? Okay. All right, so the second, what's that? As long as everything's together, it all fits. All right, I've got a worksheet to give you guys in a little bit. So we'll, we'll do the other three and then I'll give you the worksheet so you can come up. With ventilation perfusion mismatch, some but not all of the blood is shunted past the lungs. So there's stuff going on in some alveoli, but not all the alveoli. So that's ventilation perfusion mismatch. I think the textbook refers to it as a shunt like effect. A shunt like effect. It really doesn't have any application. You don't hear that being used in the hospital. You don't hear it on a test. <laughs> um, something like effect. But when you're reading in the textbook, it's going to mention ventilation perfusion mismatch as a shunt like effect. Um, hypoxemia is the result. However, it can be corrected with oxygen therapy because there are alveoli that are capable of good gas exchange. 
So you've got some good alveoli, you've got some bad alveoli. BQ mismatch. The AA gradient will be increased. So we have extra oxygen and all the alveoli, it's just not getting through into the blood. So you're going to have an increase in your AA gradient. And then it gives you some examples of when this happens. It's pneumonia. So pneumonia is when there's an infection in the lung, a bacterial infection, a viral infection, a fungal infection. And pneumonia affects um, typically the lower lobe. Tuberculosis pneumonia, that likes the upper lobes, it likes a lot of air, and it grows and, and affects the right upper lobe. But then the rest of the lung is okay. So pneumonia. Atelectasis is collapsed alveoli. And that happens usually post-op. If patients are in a lot of pain, they've had abdominal surgery, thoracic surgery, yeah, it hurts like the dickens to take a deep breath. So you come in there to motivate them and tell them how you, know, you want their oxygen level to stay good and you don't want them to get pneumonia and they have to take a deep breath. And they're usually like heavily sedated, <laughs> in pain, and they just don't want to deal with you. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to get the alveoli open so that they don't end up with um, complications. So shallow breathing leads to collapsed alveoli. So they get atelectasis after surgery. Atelectasis occurs in a lot of other reasons, so I'm just trying to give you some brief examples um, so you can understand ventilation perfusion mismatch. Um, bronchospasm happens a lot with people with reactive airways disease, so asthma. When that smooth muscle around the airway tightens up, now you don't have good ventilation getting to the alveoli. You're going to have a lower amount of oxygen in the alveoli because of it. Mucus accumulation. With mucus accumulation, imagine that you have a plugged up airway. So you've got your conducting airway and it's full of mucus. You're not going to have air flowing past all that mucus to get to the alveoli. That makes sense? Okay, pictures have been created in the mind. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a picture. In the middle, it shows an alveolus, and alveolus is getting air. So we see that the pressure of alveolar oxygen is 100 millimeters of mercury. Um, the pressure of alveolar carbon dioxide, 40 millimeters of mercury. We've got good blood flowing past it. So we'll have the same units in the blood that we do in alveolus. Over on the left, it says absolute shunt. And it sticks a, a cork in the alveolus <laughs> to show that there's no ventilation. We're not getting any fresh supply of gas into the alveolus. And when you look at the alveolus, it takes on the same values as venous blood. So venous oxygen, 40 millimeters of mercury, that's what ends up in the alveoli because there's, there's no fresh oxygen supply coming in. So it starts to look like the venous blood. CO2 looks like venous blood. And normal. And then this picture we haven't talked about yet, but it says absolute dead space. And it puts a cork on the capillary blood flow. And it doesn't let any blood flow past the alveolus. And there's no blood flowing past it, now the alveolus starts to look like the conducting airways. The oxygen level is the same as in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the same as in the atmosphere. One more and then we'll take a break. Low VQ. So low VQ, if you think about it, what does that mean? Without knowing anything else about it. Low ventilation. Good job. Um, and then it's caused by hypoventilation. 
and it gives some examples of when you would have hypoventilation. It says severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Let me tell you something. With severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the airways are so obstructed that O2 has a hard time getting into the alveoli. So I'll say that again so you can write it down. The airways are so obstructed O2 has a hard time getting into the alveoli. So airways are so obstructed that O2 has a hard time getting into the alveoli. So imagine somebody who's breathing you know, 20, 24 times a minute, they're breathing in and out, but the air doesn't get to their alveoli because their airways are so damaged. Um, typically, you run across the long-term cigarette smokers. Um, the cigarette smoke in the lungs it damages the supporting structures of the airways. The airways don't stay open. They tend to collapse. So when they're collapsed, of course, you're not going to get a fresh supply of air to the alveoli because the airways are collapsed. So it leads to um, low ventilation in the alveoli. Um, Drug-induced respiratory depression. So imagine if someone has been given or taken something that um, suppresses the drive to breathe. They're not going to get a fresh supply of air into the alveoli because they're just not breathing very much. Same thing could happen with a respiratory arrest if they stop breathing. There's it's really low ventilation because they're not breathing. Um, neuromuscular weakness. The neuromuscular, so sometimes the nerve can't communicate with the muscle because of um, what are some of the neuromuscular diseases? Like MS, multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease comes to my mind. There's a bunch of them. But the nerve isn't telling the muscle to contract. So if the diaphragm doesn't contract, or it contracts very little, you're not going to get a fresh supply of air into the alveoli. So low ventilation. These causes of hypoxemia will respond to low levels of oxygen therapy. Um, because if we give a little bit of oxygen, that little bit of oxygen will diffuse through and get to the alveoli. So you give them a one liter nasal cannula, a two liter nasal cannula, and their oxygen level comes up. It tells you that their AA gradient is normal. Does that seem confusing or does that make sense? It makes sense. There's nothing wrong with the alveolus itself. There's nothing wrong with the diffusion path. Now, if there was oxygen in the alveolus, it's gonna get through into the blood. The problem is the oxygen isn't getting to the alveolus. Low VQ, <coughs> low ventilation. AA gradient is normal. There's nothing wrong with um, the alveolus or the interstitial. Okay, so I said I would give you a break after that. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about another cause of hypoxemia. This one has a weird name. It's called dead states. The nothing dead. So the name comes from the air and alveoli becoming exactly like conducting airways. And the conclusion is, well, wow, that's the case. Let's call it dead states. So let's see what the um, presentation has. All right, with dead space, there's alveoli that have no contact with blood. And they get the name dead space alveoli. Blood flow is totally blocked, but ventilation persists unchanged. Because no carbon dioxide can enter the alveolus and no oxygen can enter the blood, 
carbon dioxide, alveolar carbon dioxide and PO2 take on room air values. The alveolus has exactly the same pressure of oxygen and pressure of carbon dioxide as the conducting airways or anatomical dead space. So that's the connection for the name dead space ventilation. No blood coming to the alveoli, the alveoli become just like dead space. This shows a picture. It shows a, a little tie around the blood vessels. So there's no blood flowing to the alveolus. So the gas in here becomes just like all the conducting airways. And we consider that dead space ventilation when there's no perfusion going to the alveolus. So what could cause that? The first one listed is pulmonary emboli. Um, those are blood clots. In the pulmonary vessels. Pulmonary emboli are blood clots in the pulmonary vessels. And blood clots can be tiny, and there could be a whole bunch, and they can be diffused throughout. There could be a big, huge blood clot right in the pulmonary artery, and it can, can completely occlude all blood flow going to one of the lungs. So pulmonary emboli, those blood clots, can vary in size, and they're very um, But because there's no blood flowing to the lungs, it can't pick up oxygen, get rid of CO2, and then um, when you draw arterial blood, you'll notice that the blood level is low. Um, the other cause, it lists low blood pressure and flow. And that, when there's really low blood pressure, we see the patient is in shock when the blood pressure is really low. Um, this can be due to blood loss. So if they start bleeding a lot after surgery, um, trauma, gunshot wound, stab wound, they lose a lot of blood. Um, you'll ventilate like crazy, but the oxygen that's in the alveoli can't get into the blood because there's no blood coming by to pick up the oxygen. Um, it can also happen when the heart is not pumping effectively. So um, heart failure, same thing. The heart isn't pushing the blood to the lungs to pick up the oxygen. So you get dead space ventilation. So if you're asked to figure out, well, what's causing the hypoxemia? Is it shunt? Is it DQ mismatch? Hypoventilation? Oh, this one doesn't have this space on. So it's just asking you to pick between the three. Is it shunt, DQ mismatch, or hypoventilation? Is the carbon dioxide in arterial blood higher than normal? So you ask yourself that question. And we said normal was 40 millimeters of mercury. Well, this is giving you a range between 35 and 45 is normal. So if the CO2 is higher than normal, we say yes. Um, but the AA gradient is normal, then we have hypoventilation or low DQ, low ventilation to perfusion. Um, we talked about some examples of hypoventilation. Can you think of any off the top of your head? Um, low ventilation. Um, so, so it has no DQ mismatch. Um, which one? You said hypo, what kind of hypoventilation is that affected with drug? Yes. Mm -hmm. So drug-induced respiratory depression. Mm -hmm. So somebody's not breathing very much. Their CO2 is going to build in their blood because they're not exhaling and getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, but what if the CO2 is not high? What if CO2 is in normal range? Then what? Well, then you ask yourself a second question. Does a small percentage of oxygen improve the arterial PaO2 or pressure of oxygen in arterial blood? Uh, so a small percentage of O2. <coughs> Why don't you circle that and say, like up to a non-reader mask or up to 100%. 
So if we deliver supplemental oxygen, does that improve the arterial PaO2? Did you change it or add to it? Mm -hmm. A small percentage of O2, maybe like a nasal cannula up to an unread reader mask. All right, does that improve arterial PaO2? So when you put this on the patient, or did the saturation come up into a normal range? If it did, then you say, ah, oh, the patient has VQ mismatch. There's something going on in the lungs, but it's not so bad that all the blood is being shunted past the lungs without picking up oxygen. Some of those alveoli are participating in gas exchange. So we would say it's VQ mismatch. So if the O2 goes up? Yes, if the O2 goes up, VQ mismatch. But what if the O2 doesn't go up? The patient does not respond to oxygen. That's a shunt. So in that case, we would say uh, that we have a shunt. that hand up and I'll give you a few minutes to complete it. So this gives you four scenarios and it asks you to pick out whether it's a shunt, VQ mismatch, low VQ, or dead space ventilation. 